Well, it's the end of the class as we know it, and I feel fine. And congratulations to you for getting through all of this material. We said I really just wanted to teach you about the attacks on flash protections and the attacks on SMM and the attacks that undercut the defenses on those attacks. And there was all this prerequisite material we had to learn about, about flash access and PCI configuration address space, PCIe, option ROMs, port IO in order to get access to those uh, configuration address spaces and so forth. So good job sticking with it through all of this background material as well. Now, if you have photographic recall of all of the information that we covered in this class, then you're done. You don't have to watch the rest of this video. But it was suggested by one of the beta testers that actually they wanted a conclusion video. I didn't have one originally, but um, I'm adding one because they made the good point that it would be nice if there was a quick way to come back to the material if you've, you know, set it down for three months, six months, a year come back and have a quick summary of what we covered in this class. So that's what the rest of this video is, just a quick as summary, as fast as we can go, so let's get to it. So what did we learn about in this class? We learned that they who run first run best, and we learned computers work by starting in a firmware and loading up a bootloader, loading up an operating system, a virtualization system, and then loading applications that do useful things. And we said it behooves an attacker to get in as early as possible here because they can then compromise and rewrite the code for all of the downstream things in order to compromise it. We also talked about how the sort of notions of rings as they exist in Intel's architecture, ring three being the least privileged, ring zero more privileged, and then nominally, you know, ring negative one, negative two, negative three, et cetera. This is a good notion, but it doesn't really work these days. You know, things have been called, you know, negative one, negative two, negative three. There's gaps. Uh, there's different privileges that other things like DMA capable peripherals have. And so while it works as a fine enough shorthand, reality is it's more complex and more messy down at these levels uh, and so you know we generally don't use those terms in this class. Then we moved on to talking about the reset vector, the place where the x86 processor fetches its first assembly instruction. And we saw how Simix, the full system simulator, just showed all of these shadow or hidden portions of the segment registers that we talked about in Architecture 2001. And so that was nice, it just put them all up in our face. And therefore, it showed us nice and clearly how the reset vector has a default value for the CS base, so the base address used to calculate where memory access is, base of four Fs and four zeros. Then it had a default IP address of three Fs and one zero, and that, when added together, meant that you had a default assembly instruction address to be fetched from of seven Fs and a zero. So 16 bytes less than four gigabytes. So basically that high area of physical memory is always mapped to the spy flash chip to the end of the spy flash chip, minus 16 bytes. And that's the end of the original four gigabyte 32 bit address space minus 16 bytes. Then we talked about how if the processor would load something up, so if the BIOS, if the firmware loads up something other than that default reset value, then you would start getting a typical 16-bit segmented uh, register usage. And how that worked was that you had your 16-bit segment selectors, you know, the typical segment registers, and then that was shifted left by four bits, and that was added to what other, other, what ever other register you were accessing. And that gave you a 20-bit linear address because in the original 8086, there was no protected mode. There was no uh, virtual memory or anything like that. It was just this sort of access into these 20-bit uh, linear address chunks. Then we started talking about chipsets and how the MCH ICH was out of scope for this class, even though uh, technically Simix was using that and at least the free version, there was no way to reconfigure it to use PCHs. We talked about uh, having you look up the two devices of interest to us in this class. The DRAM controller, which you saw was used for some things around SMM, and the LPC device, which you saw was used for things around spy flash access for legacy reasons. So we said, you know, five to nine series, you would look up the CPU data sheet to find that, you would look up the PCH specification update data sheet to find the LPC device, which then moved to the PCH data sheet, which then moved to the CPU IO data sheet, which then moved to the CPU on package PCH datasheet. So at that point, EmojiMe was very distraught and annoyed by the fact that Intel kept moving things around all the time. Doesn't make it easy to teach a class. We revisited the concept from Architecture 2001 of you know, paging and access to memory. And we said back then that you, know, you might have a linear address space, then that gets translated through page tables to access the physical address space. But RTFM had determined that was a lie. And so in this class, we, we introduced the concept of memory mapped I.O. and the notion that if you had some particular address, like this address right there, 
that when you tried to access physical memory, you were not actually accessing RAM, but instead accessing some sort of hardware, some sort of peripheral, in this case, the BIOS spy flash chip. You might also be accessing something like a NIC card. We said that part of the firmware's job is to reconfigure and you know, set up all the registers to organize this memory map of different things, you know, what can be used as normal memory, what's going to be reserved for memory mapped I.O. and things like that, what's hard coded to always be uh, redirected to flash. And so then we talked about you know, what exactly is memory mapped I.O. And we talked about how you know, the processor might be trying to access some particular memory address but then the memory controller would have to consult something like a lookup table to say, is that memory address actually DRAM that I should be accessing or is it some sort of peripheral? If it was DRAM, then sure, fine, go ahead and redirect that access to RAM and give it back to the rest of the processor to operate on. If on the other hand, that particular address was memory mapped IO, such as PCI, let's say configuration address space, then it would redirect to some PCH, uh, sorry, PCI hardware. And that would, you know, for instance, maybe go to a PCI NIC card. And the NIC card would then decide what exactly that particular address maps to. Like that's just a internal decision by the PCI hardware. And let's say it went to memory. You can see now I've sped up all these animations for convenience. And then it goes back and you get some memory, but that, you know, memory access was actually accessing something internal to a PCIe card. And you can also then have something like the equivalent accessing spy hardware. Boom, boom, done, great. And we said the most important thing is what does this picture look like to you? And if you said it doesn't look like anything to me, you're probably a robot because it actually looks like Michelangelo. Then we talked about port IO. Port IO was, you know, relevant for some things like keyboard controllers and CMOS and very importantly, port B2 for SMM access, the sort of nominal SMM system call used by convention by PC BIOS vendors across the world. And we also talked about variable port IO. In particular, the ones that were interesting to us were PM base and TICO base. PM base used for ACPI came up later on in the context of sleep wake attacks, and TICO base came up in the context of the hardware that was used for certain SMM operations, which we potentially wanted to suppress the SMIs for. All right, need a break? Go ahead, pause. It's okay, I'll be here when you get back. All right, let's continue on. So then we talked about the two different port access styles. There was the address data style, which we had technically seen back in Architecture 2001 in the context of CMOS, port 70 and 71. And that is this notion that the port that you're accessing corresponds to some particular device where you might have a address port, and that says like what address inside of some nominal black box you're trying to access. And then you would have a data port where you could either write to that address or read from that address. And then we declared a different type of style, just called it poke peek, where it was this notion that maybe you're poking a device and giving it some command of something to do, and then maybe you're peeking at in like a status register to find out you know, what the result of that was. Could be the same port, could be two different ports, might be adjacent, might not. Then we looked at some examples of port IO and we could see very clearly these two different styles. We could see you know, just a bunch of writes out to a bunch of different ports, 33, you know, taking the same FF, writing it out to 33 and 237 and 161 and 237 again. And then we could see some address data access, which was defined by us, by which was sort of visible to us by the sort of adjacent and continuous like write to one particular thing, in this case, CF8, the address port of PCIe, and then writing or reading from CFC, which was the data port. And that, of course, as we learned later on in the class when we got to PCIe, was used to read and write from the configuration address space of PCI devices. Then we learned about PCI devices. And specifically, you know, it's this notion of 256 buses, uh, 32 devices, eight functions, and it's, you know, got some sort of topology. So you could have a bus with, you know, many devices with a single device. And we talked about how Intel would generally reserve bus zero for their own internal you know, CPU internal, PCH internal, ICH internal, MCH internal, their own internal hardware uh, utilization of things. And we said these functions, you know, you could have multiple functions from a particular device and you could have some complex devices where different functions might be accessing different cores, but uh, more often than not, they were just sort of uh, different functionality of the same device. Then we talked about the PCIe 3 address spaces, the 256 byte configuration address space, which was required, and then the optional memory mapped IO spaces and port IO spaces. 
Later on, once we learned about PCI bars, we understood that these TBD number of bytes had to do with how the particular hardware behaved and how the particular drivers, you know, mapped it into some particular space. And basically it just, you know, it would be a memory mapped IO or a port IO way of accessing internal, you know, registers, memory, non-volatile storage from a particular PCIe device. Again, we said that, you know, bus zero is the backbone of the system. This nice old picture showed us in a better way than the newer pictures that, you know, there's these internal fabric that always is using bus zero for internal stuff that we care about, like the DRAM controller or the LPC device. Then we spent a lot of time reinforcing where PCI configure address space is concerned, BDFO or GTFO. You needed to be able to index into a particular bus device function and offset. And just to reinforce one more time, CF8 was the PCI configuration address space address, and CFC was used as a configuration address space data, right? So someone would write something to CF8, and that would specify some particular offset in the PCI configure address space, and then they would write to or read from CFC in order to read or write from that offset. This was how the BDFO broke down for legacy compatible configuration address space access. You only could access 8 bits, 8 bit 256 bytes offset into the register. And then it was 3 bits for function because there's 8 functions, 5 bits for device because there's 2 to the 5, 32 devices, and 8 bits for bus, 2 to the 8, 256 buses. Then once we understood a little bit better about PCIe, we could go back and you know understand some of the assembly we looked at before and we saw we could decode the assembly and see, oh, it's accessing you know bus zero device 31 offset zero. What is that? Oh, that's LPC device. And that's you know thing that we actually saw when we were looking up the various IDs. Then we wanted to see what exactly was in this PCI configuration address space. And there was sort of a standardized version of that. There was this 16 bytes at the beginning, the sort of header header, as I called it, which is required and standardized and must be there and everything. And then there was the rest of this, which was optional, which may or may not be there. Things like the base address registers or the expansion ROM base address were the interesting bits to us. So then, you know, I had the joke about the horse and the bars. Now I'm going to explain the joke to you because my wife didn't get the joke. And that's okay. It's okay if you don't get the joke, but you know, it's not going to be funny. I'm going to explain it to you anyways, but here's the joke, right? So I said, you know, the horse said, you know, I don't think I am. Right? It didn't think it was an alcoholic. It said, I don't think I am. I don't think I am. I am. I don't think. I don't think I am. Now the joke was Rene Descartes, the famous, you know, Cartesian uh, person who gave us the Cartesian coordinate system, mathematician and philosopher. Rene Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Right? So the horse said, I don't think I am. And so it disappeared. Okay, boom, you've been decarded. All right, anyways, base address registers, right? We, we then wanted to talk about the base address registers. Those were ways of creating a memory mapped IO or port IO access into the PCI configuration, oh, sorry, into the PCI device. And so, you know, basically a driver or a PCI option ROM could basically poke at these base address registers and fill in some sort of base address, which would then be where it would be either memory mapped or port IO mapped. And we saw that there was sort of a wacky way of finding out the size of that. You know, someone would write all ones into the thing and then it would return back, you know, some ones and some zeros. And then we could do like two's complement and we could use that to determine, you know, what the actual size of the address space was that they wanted to use. But also, you know, you couldn't set any of these zeros to uh, be one when you were actually specifying an address. Basically, these bits were the only bits you could use to specify the base address. So yeah, bars were a little bit uh, interesting. We, you know, we did this decoding. Okay, I said we did this decoding earlier, but I guess we didn't. So we could look at some assembly and we could decode this using that BDFO decoding that we learned about. You know, the bottom is, you know, eight bits for the offset and then three bits and then five bits and then eight bits again, et cetera, right? So we learned about that. And we saw that in that particular case, you know, the Dell Optiflex 7010 was uh, accessing something that we would come to learn about much later on. So accessing the RCBA, ABC, CBA, ABC, CBA, ABC, CBA, Mirror Universe Spock, right? ABC, CBA. And then the Rickerbaugh, right? The Rickerbaugh, the Rickerbaugh, right? So what was that? That was the root complex base address register block. 
And, you know, we talked about the root complex and we said the root complex is a PCI thing and it's, you know, used as sort of the intermediary between, you know, CPU and the memory. So both the CPU can get access to memory, CPU can get access to PCI devices, PCI devices can get access to memory, and actually PCI devices can do sort of their peer-to-peer -peer transactions as well. But we didn't talk about that in this class. It's okay. Right, so we learned about, you know, RCBA and holding Rickerbaugh, and we said we are going to come back to that later on because of, you know, spy flash access. We were eventually going to get there because there's Rickerbaugh plus Hex 3800 on older systems, ICHs and PCH 5 through 9 series. That was where you would find the memory mapped I.O. registers for spy flash access. Back in the PCI configure address space, we then eventually did learn about the PCIe extended configuration address space so that instead of just being 256 bytes, you could access a full four kilobytes, right? Hex 1000 bytes of space. Extra stuff, but it wasn't actually that common. We had a lab where we said, you know, go find this. And if you would have went down the line with all the different, you know, devices in your data sheet, CPU and PCH, you would have only found very few devices that were actually using this extended configuration address space at least from the Intel built-in devices. I don't know how common it is across all of the PCI devices in the world. I haven't looked at all the PCI devices in the world. All right, so how do we actually then access that extended PCI configuration address space? It's not possible to do it through port IO. You can only access eight bits through that. That's why that's the compatible or legacy configuration address space. You can only do this through memory mapped IO. That required setting up a register called PCI X bar, generally zero port. Bus device function 000, offset 60. That would be a particular memory location where you could have potentially every single bus device function uh, mapped into memory where it would be one, you know, hex 1000 or four kilobytes per bus device function. And then you would just multiply that out by, you know, eight functions times 31 devices times 256 buses. And that would give you a total of 256 megabytes of memory that would potentially have to be reserved. But we said there was actually ways that, you know, you didn't, most devices are not going to have or utilize every single bus device function in uh, the configured address space. So there were options to reduce the amount of memory that was stolen down to 128. So half the space, you can only access half the buses or 64. Again, you can only then access one quarter of the buses. And so we said there was a different sort of access, you know, the port IO access would only give us the eight bits of offset and this would give us 12 bits of offset once you started from that PCI X bar address. Then we moved on to PCI option ROM attacks and I gave you a brief history of attacks, but we're not gonna cover that. You can go look at it again later. The important thing to us was that expansion ROM base address behaves basically the same as the other bars that we learned about up here. And so what was the job of the BIOS? It would basically take and map something into memory, it would copy that into RAM, and then it would invoke the option ROM from RAM. And so in the context of the BIOS, you're some point early in boot, the you know, operating system totally hasn't run yet, bootloader hasn't run yet. The, the BIOS, the firmware, is basically going to pull out this arbitrary blob of code and it's just going to run it, right? Well, you know, as you'll learn in future classes, things like secure boot systems are supposed to do, you know, integrity checks over that so that it's not such a trivial attack. But, you know, those sort of mechanisms are fraught with their own sort of peril. Then we finally got into more of the area that we were hoping to get into, which was spy flash chips. And so I very briefly talked about, you know, this notion of descriptor mode behavior versus non-descriptor mode. We said originally non-descriptor was the only thing, then there was a phase where they both were supported, and then modern systems only support descriptor mode, except for, you know, some of the atoms and, you know, embedded systems type devices. So the important thing to us about descriptor mode was that it supported multiple bus masters so that, you know, the management engine and the CPU and the embedded controller and the gigabit ethernet, they could all share the spy flash and have, you know, isolated regions where hopefully they wouldn't clobber each other's spy flash. And so part of the point of going into the spy flash section was to first take you behind the scenes from the magic of just magically accessing the spy and, you know, somehow things would get written there. And so we talked about, you know, PCI memory mapped IO would help you find things like the spy bar, flash uh, memory mapped IO registers. So instead of that being magic, you know, we learned about the secret, you know, Keeler elves behind the scenes that Intel employs in the PCH in order to do its dirty work of, you know, translating access into the spy flash. We learned that there was hardware sequencing and software sequencing. Hardware sequencing was sort of an abstraction where you had these registers and you just said, well, I want to read from address hex 1000 and write four bytes. But then the happy little elves would basically turn this into an actual spy protocol thing behind the scenes. So you, the programmer, don't have to worry about how that works. You just, you know, know what this interface is that Intel gave to you. And behind the scenes, they do all the hard work of 
how to get off to the hardware. But if you wanted, there was the software sequencing way of saying specifically, I want to issue this exact spy opcode to be handed off to the spy chip. And then we once again saw our friend that we had hoped to meet, our CBA holding Rickerba, which found us our way to get to those particular spy flash access chip uh, registers. Right, and then there was the much less cool, not particularly well-named, you know, the BIOS spy bar zero membar as the alternative way on the modern systems. We went in depth onto this whole sequence of like how exactly you can read and write from the flash. And just to go over it one more time, right? So setting the flash address to something, that's going to be the address to read, enter a size to read into the flash data byte count, then the type of cycle, so in this case, a read cycle, then you check to make sure no one's using it. So you're checking the status and making sure there's not a cycle in progress. And you just keep checking, wait for it to not be cycle in progress. Then you say go on whatever transaction you're trying to do, like a read, then that magic happens behind the scenes. Wait till the status says done, F done. And once it's done, then you can go ahead and read the contents from the data registers for however much data you ask to read. But the maximum is 64 bytes at a time. We learned about, you know, the spy flash storage. There was a little bit of, you know, miscellaneous in there about how different things are used. But the most important thing was that this in descriptor mode, the PCH expects there to be a flash descriptor at the base, at the zeroth offset or hex tenth offset of the spy flash. And that descriptor describes the rest of the BIOS. That tells the hardware what the layout is and where it can expect things like the BIOS region, which should always be at the end because the end of the spy flash chip is mapped to the end of the four gigabyte range. So your reset vector is always gonna be at the end of this minus hex 10. And then there were the other regions for the management engine, gigabit ethernet, platform data, and embedded controller with space to grow in the future. Now, those of you who did the optional lab on parsing you know, a spy flash descriptor for the Intel Optiplex Sorry, for the Dell Optiplex 7010, congratulations, you were inducted into the Gritty Gang. Those of you who didn't, it's okay, you can do it later. Then we finally talked about the threat trees. You know, it's red versus green. Who is stronger? Green Hulk stop, red Hulk now. Right, so these threat trees, we talked about the different ways. You know, what is the attacker's goal? They want to write to the spy flash chip. This is where we wanted to get in this class. What's their goal? They want to write to the spy flash chip. What's the defender's goal? They want to stop them. How are they going to do that? Let's start with protected range registers, but protected range registers could be set incorrectly. And so, you know, someone could just get around them that way. It could be not locked. If you don't lock them, then the attacker can just come in and change them. There were the sleep-wake vulnerabilities, which just unset those when you go to sleep, as we learned about later in the class. And then there's just this notion of, well, I don't care if you set the protected range registers. I'm just going to exploit the BIOS before you ever get a chance to set them. And then I'll still achieve my goal because I'll have code execution before the flash is locked down. And then I can go rewrite the flash to achieve persistent code execution. We also learned about BIOS lock enable. This was the way that, you know, unlike protected range registers, which limited, you know, they said this specific area right here is non-writable. Well, we learned that, you know, there are certain areas like NVRAM, which is not going to be protectable by that because the firmware is going to expect some sort of capability to rewrite it. So Intel has the alternative, which is the BIOS lock enable interaction between the BIOS write enable. And there we learned about, you know, again, sleep wake vulnerabilities will, you know, unset things uh, like the BIOS lock enable bit. Uh, we said you could exploit it again, same thing. The attacker who compromises system management mode can actually defeat this because the whole point of this is that SMM is the one who actually goes and rewrites the BIOS write enable. And because that's the case, you know, suppressing those SMIs and not giving the SMM code a chance to rewrite it to zero will mean that, you know, it will still remain unprotected. And then there was a hardware race condition, which would actually be exploitable to get around that checks as well. And we also said that the attacker doesn't have to play your games with doing a software only exploit. They could just get physical control over a device and try to compromise it that way. It could be as simple as just attaching a flash clip and rewriting the BIOS. That could work. There's defensive mechanisms such as making it hard to clip on or, you know, for instance, preventing the system from booting if it sees an unexpected modification. And then there's also the notion of an attacker coming in with debug access to get potentially ephemeral access early in boot, earlier than any of these locks are set, and then to write themselves in that way. And again, you know, things like boot card can help with that, but boot card has its own problems, misconfigurations, and everything else that'll be covered in a future class.
Moving on from spy flash, we talked about SMM and we said that, you know, while the reset vector and the spy flash would, you know, move around in this, there was this separate mode off to the side set up by the BIOS. So fundamentally less privileged than the BIOS because the BIOS gets to set it up. The BIOS can choose what code goes in there, but consequent, but which has like inter interesting interactions like that BIOS lock enable and interesting interactions for things like trusted execution technology, like we'll talk about in a future class. We said there's many different ways that the system management interrupts can fire for different, mostly hardware reasons, some software reasons like that port B2 write. And we highlighted some causes of them, the BIOS lock enable, uh, the advanced, the, the port B2, and some causes that are just interesting from a malware perspective, ways for them to get code execution at opportune times. We said the only way out of SMM is the resume assembly instruction. And if you try to run that anywhere else, you're gonna crash. When you're inside of SMM, there's sort of this save state area where you know information will be saved off so that you can resume your way back out. There's always a fixed entry point at SMBase plus hex 8000, and SMBase, as we saw, can be you know potentially relocated. It has a default value of hex 30,000, so it's always going to be that at processor reset. But then you know the processor, the, the firmware might choose to you know take that, uh, save off some copy go ahead and execute some code that rewrites the saved copy. And then when it resumes out of SMM, the SM base internal processor register will be rewritten. And then uh, consequently the firmware can expect that that is the location which will be having SMM, uh, SMI handlers executed forevermore. Oh, hey, and here's Dark Sonic who we didn't get to use as much as I would have liked. So, SMRAM had multiple locations, but we said, you know, these days HSEG isn't even possible. So there was compatible CSEG and TSEG. And then compatible or CSEG range was used as this low address, you know, A and four zeros up to B and four Fs. That was, you know, the original location where it was. But then, and, oh, sorry. And then we learned about, you know, the, the lockdowns that can occur on that and how, you know, that can be accessible and you can put your SMM code in there. But uh, once someone goes ahead and sets the D open to zero, then that will no longer be open. That'll go back to being interpreted as video memory and writes to video memory. And then once they set the D lock equal to one, then no longer are you able to change the D open or the D lock. And consequently, you're basically, this is video memory and no one should be able to access or see or read SMM after that, unless you exploit SMM. We also saw how in the 10th generation and later systems, at least the Ice Lake ones, even CSEG went away and now we've just got TSEG. And so that was defined as a particular area of memory. So you would start at the sort of TOLID, top of lower usable DRAM. And then there was some stolen DRAM for the graphics, two different types of stolen. And then that stolen minus some amount is the TSEG base. And so that's where you would expect your SMM to be. And there's Dark Sonic again. And so we saw all sorts of different things about, you know, how an attacker could, you know, compromise it through misconfiguration, through, you know, sleep-wake vulnerabilities, uh, through cache attacks, remap attacks, standard, you know, vulnerabilities in SMI handlers. So a whole bunch of different things, you know, which now in the light of, you know, years later, we can sort of categorize into particular uh, buckets of types of attacks, some more common than others. So finally, we learned about, you know, power wells and power planes. We learned about how, you know, the hardware can power down things when it goes into low power modes like ACPI S3 sleep, right? And that was the interesting bit to us was this notion of going to sleep can actually mean that you will lose power to some chunks of hardware, some registers. And that was important because that would mean some of our lock bits would come unlocked. So in the you know, tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise, there was Darth Venomous the Vulnerable. So if Darth Venomous is running along at boot time, normally he would basically take some configuration bits and he would write them into a boot script. And the idea was that you know, after he would go to sleep, there would be an expectation that that hardware would all power down and consequently you know, those values would go away. So if an attacker like Darth Plagueis came around and modified those saved values, well, then when Darth Venomous woke back up, he would go ahead and run along code execution, should have sped up these animations, and eventually would get to the, you know, boot script execution. And this is the point where those locks were supposed to be relocked, but, you know, Darth Plagueis has gone ahead and modified these to allow him to get himself reinvoked, right? Dispatch opcode is basically just a jump to arbitrary code. So now while the, con while the system's in this completely unlocked state, you jump to arbitrary code, and now the BIOS is open and unlocked and prime for compromise.
So there was a whole attack tree behind that as well in terms of how you potentially protect the S3 lockbox, how you could potentially just do away with it entirely by just setting values on reset. So wow, that whirlwind tour turned into a bit of a slog, didn't it? Well, thanks for sticking with it one more time. I hope you enjoyed the class as much as I enjoyed making it. So I want you to go forth and use this power for good. Go secure all the systems, do more research. You know, I want to read your future research and, you know, stay tuned for future firmware classes.